Coming up today on Locked On Texas Tech, running down the list of things we were learned up on at Lowry Field on Saturday. And on a hoops front, Bacho headed to the bayou. Next on Locked On Texas Tech. You are Locked On Texas Tech, your daily podcast on the Texas Tech Red Raiders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We're going to start this thing off right. Everything runs through Lubbock. Glad to have you along for the ride again on Locked On Texas Tech on the Locked On Podcast Network. Thanks for always making us your first listen every day on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts. Today's episode brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, America's number one sportsbook and the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more and visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. He's the only Chris Level. I'm Casey Cowan coming to you on the other side of the red black game 2023 style chris uh spring practice number 15 in the books and we knew that we would see some interesting things that may not quite replicate into the regular season given how many uh stalwarts you had not suiting up for this contest from lowry field on saturday but that also provided some opportunity for some guys behind them maybe to flash as well and i think we got some of that some things to discuss on both sides of the ball, all phases of the game, of course. And I think at the end of the day, uh, and some fans may debate, you know, in general where an offense or defense should be for most teams at this point in the calendar, uh, regardless of talent or experience or returners, things like that. But at the end of the day, probably as uh, a lot of Red Raider fans anticipated, I think you had a conversation that was mostly dominated by Tim DeRuiter's defense from uh, the early goings to later on. Uh, making some plays, and I don't even remember what the points said on the screen, but uh, I felt like the defense. <laughs> I felt like the defense really had a day. Yeah, you know the the, the thing about these spring game celebration, whatever slash, uh, you know, like events. Uh, they're they're it's for, it's for the fans. It, it's it's for the younger players. I think it's not necessarily for the older guys, as you mentioned. A lot of guys were were out. Or, or held out or just weren't available to play uh, this past weekend. And, but the main thing was is you, you, that nobody got dinged up in this, in this scrimmage on Saturday. And that's the, that's the thing that, you know, Coach uh, Kitley, Coach DeRuiter, and Coach McGuire all said uh, leading into the game, hey, man, just nobody, you know, we want to get out healthy. And, and they did that. And I, I think that anytime you watch your own team play, and scrimmage in a in a live situation. If if anything good happens, then something bad has happened. And so I think that depending on how you want to view this, you can either kind of be panicky about some interceptions or some tipped passes, um, or you can kind of be real optimistic and excited about the ability to create uh, turnovers and be opportunistic there. Uh, I so uh, that that was. Uh, that that's that's one of the big takeaways people will have if they just watch this game. But I think uh, I think Tyler and Barron had really really done well all spring. I think the offense had maybe been a bit better overall going into Saturday hmm. uh, in in the spring than the defense because I think again there's so many defensive guys missing. Yeah, you know, and and I think that was uh, that was documented over the weekend just how many are are not participating right now. But all, all should be back in in the middle of the summer. But yeah, it was just it was a clean uh, scrimmage from an injury standpoint. Uh, it was pretty quick, about an hour and a half, ninety minutes. And but you, you 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 know, I think you saw a lot of good things. There's a lot of players that flashed, and we can get into some of that as the week rolls along here on some of the different position groups and things like that. But uh, it, it, it was kind of fun to watch. But Tim DeRuiter is is really good at what he does. I think people are starting to see that, and I'm thrilled that he is here. And he's got a lot of guys back on that side of the ball. Yeah, and I, I may be overstating it a little bit as far as the disparity between uh, defense and offense because the offense did have some moments as well. But, you know, I guess really where I, I was kind of taken aback or what got my attention so early on, Chris, was within the trenches. And that's just where I'm inclined to, to concentrate uh, most Saturdays or Sundays or Thursdays or Fridays or Tuesdays for Maction or when. You know, when I play football, that's where I, I typically zone in. Um, and I I knew who wasn't there for the defensive front, guys like Hutchings and Bradford. 
And of course, there's so much on the offensive line this offseason as far as hopes invested in progress that is going to be made. And we're doing so much of that with uh, the same faces, but in new places along the offensive line. And then there are guys like, you know, Cole Spencer and such that we've heard about, but haven't seen about. So there's a whole lot to consider there. But I just think so quickly when I saw what seemed like the the defensive front getting be- getting the better of the offensive front, I was like, whoa, because I really thought with some of the context of this spring game specifically, again, no, no Bradford, no Hutchings. And I'm not trying to say that it was plan A for the offensive line necessarily, but um, that, that got my attention, I think, right out of the gate. You're really feeling like, man, there's – and maybe it's just like energy level, intensity level. I don't know. But it certainly seemed like the defense knew uh, when the whistle blew and the game was on, whatever game it is, because I know it's a lot of two-hand touch and, you know, ghost tackles and things like that. But uh, the intensity really seemed to be there for that defense uh, right out of the gates. You, you know, one thing that is very noticeable about your team, and I think it's it's mainly because of your 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 defense and 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 things like that. But you're you're just a lot bigger. Yeah, you you just are. Uh, I don't know any other way to 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 say it to to shine that up. Um, you, you're just bigger across the board. I think you're th- th- there. There's a lot of uh, length and height and bulk, uh, and, and it's not just up front per se, but with your, your linebackers and your DBs and things like that. And I, I just think you're, and you've got more bigger people. Okay. Than used to used to get a handful of your guys and then it really just fell off. And yeah. I mean, you, you just start looking at your defensive line, for example, you know, we, we know about Cole and Linton and obviously Bradford and, and Hutchings are, are older. They're, they're not, they're not the, they're both 300 pound type guys, but not super tall, but you just look at the the Harvey Dysons, the Charles Esters, the the Duda Banks who wasn't there the other day, uh, Joseph Adetere. I mean, it just kind of goes on and on. And then you start talking about the Isaac Smiths on the edge, uh, Terrell Tillman who came here from Oregon on the edge at six five, uh, Blake Burris who who tipped a, a pass down the other day and I think actually maybe caused another interception with another tip. He's six foot five. I mean, so. Yeah. There's just a lot of length and height and bulk and, and all that. And I just think that, that Joey's a trenches guy. I mean, he, he he's really, uh, I think, focused on that as much as anything that you, you went up front. And I think, but it's just noticeable, like the old eyeball test. Uh, because I can't tell you how many times, you know, Tyree Wilson still last year stuck out like a sore thumb. But you start to have guys now to where he doesn't, it, when he's down there, he doesn't just, you know, because I mean, Miles Cole is technically a bit bigger and, and got longer arms and and all that. Uh, but it, it's just, uh, it's kind of nice to see the change is that you can kind of pass the old eyeball test. Like, yeah, man, we, we need some film of us getting off the plane now. Whereas before you're like, hey, man, <laughs> no, 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 nobody have a camera out there. Yeah, <laughs> we just use footage from the longest <laughs> yard when the, the uh, inmates get off the bus. Um I don't really, and you're exactly right about Coach McGuire. That is one thing that has scratched me where I itch, that has tickled my fancy all day, every day since he's arrived. Him emphasizing over and over and over, building inside out, talking about uh, trench work, making the dream work, and any other cliche you can think might be painted on a high school football stadium somewhere. I just don't <laughs> know. I, I, I guess I didn't know early on how to gauge, like, all right, which of these talking points are kind of like, his polished points that he's bringing with him, and then which ones will will manifest during his time here in West Texas. Well, the trench thing has has gone that way, really. And I know it wasn't all him. Tyree Wilson was here before Coach McGuire was here, obviously. But seeing what they've done since as far as the uh, players they're going after, whether that's transfer or prep level, the inside-out thing is real as far as that approach is concerned. At least it seems to be that way to me. And I used to be so green with envy Baylor green don't pardon the pun deal with it it'll be good for you to kick off this week because and coach McGuire was not there under Art Bryles but I remember watching Art Bryles program Chris and and that program in Waco going from afterthought to someone that's competing for Big 12 hardware some spectacular individual players like RG3 obviously helping that but in my opinion watching that program under Art Bryles when they began to find their footing was inside out. It was always like, yeah, air raid, but air raid that'll smack you in the mouth and may run for 300 yards or whatever. 
It was built inside out. And I know that's the most difficult thing to do. Everybody wants all the offensive linemen. Everybody wants all the defensive linemen. It's not like some secret, you know, among football minds that, ah, we can skip the inside. We're building from the outside in. Like maybe Matt Millen, if he's your general manager, shout out to the Detroit Lions, will build outside in. No, we want another wide receiver. Yeah, let's make it another one. But I don't find many who do that and find much success, so it's really hard to do. And I think that Coach McGuire, to be honest with you, like in so many other areas, like speaks these things into existence in a way. It's not like some mystical, magical thing, although there's a portion of it that could be, I suppose. But he says this is what this is what we're trying to do, and we see them taking steps in that direction. So I was really excited to just see in general uh, because the offense did have some some opportunity up front uh, to make some plays or did show some things, I think, up front uh, that I like to see. But I would also caution anyone, of course, offensively, uh, as it relates to, to what Coach Kitley had going on with the play sheet. I mean, what were we really seeing? You know, what type of rhythm were you in offensively compared to where you might be uh, on a college football Saturday? Uh, so I, I'm not saying it's it's just apples to apples on both sides of the ball, but inside out, inside out, inside out. Remember that. Write it down. Take a picture. We don't give a what. Just make sure you know about it <laughs> because that's what you're going to see play out, I think, in the fall. Let's uh, let's get to some of these um, – the, these topics that I know I've well, I've already heard from some Red Raider fans about, and I know plenty are wondering about out there. Uh, Chris, let's start with your pair of quarterbacks that you saw. Unfortunately, one of the things that did generate a lot of intensity <laughs> and excitement for the defense was a tip pass on, what, I think the third play of the game, second play of the game maybe from uh, Tyler Shuck. I saw C.J. Baskerville and some others getting involved, and obviously that amped them up. How did you uh, process the day you saw from the Red Raider quarterbacks and Tyler Shuck and Baron Morton? Because uh, both had some moments, and I might dare say what I perceive to be the backup quarterback right now, Chris, was just flashy enough to keep this QB competition conversation <laughs> rolling, maybe all the way to week one or two of fall camp. I don't know how you saw that, but I thought that dynamic was really interesting Saturday at Lowry Field. But first, today's episode brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book and the official sports book of Locked On. Got the NBA playoffs going on, Major League Baseball, Tibetan tiddlywinks, or anything in between that's on your radar. FanDuel has got you covered. And right now, if you've never done it before, you're in luck because it's a great time to be a new customer. You can get started with FanDuel right now by downloading the FanDuel app, safe, secure, Easy to use. Woo! First timers, when you get the app, you're going to immediately be eligible for a no sweat first bet. Up to 1000 bucks. Just go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to sign up now, place your first bet, and get up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. So don't miss your chance to get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. When you join FanDuel today by Downloading the FanDuel app or go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up with FanDuel, an official partner of Major League Baseball. Remind You brought his name up a while ago. Remind me to tell you the Matt Millen uh, story sometime on here. Uh, you got a Matt Millen story? I do. Yeah. And, I rode in an involved, elevator with him in San Diego. It involves Texas Tech in San Diego, as a matter <laughs> of fact. Yes. I complimented him on his commitment to overalls because even in his <laughs> NFL Network football life, uh, episode he was rocking overalls and yeah. he did not receive my humor yeah that did not seem like in an appreciable way yeah yeah we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that sometime that's okay. funny yeah yeah um yeah you you I, I think that's part of it uh like the the QB look you don't want to turn it over I think you praise the defense and, and all those things you don't want to turn it over I think uh offensively this was extremely vanilla I think there were there were certain points where, where he didn't want his quarterbacks checking into certain things um, so you don't have the full you know playbook available to you certainly didn't have your full complement of, of players uh, available to you and around you um, I, I think uh, they did not run tempo a ton unless I think they got into the red zone uh, situation and I think that's when they kind of sped it up a little bit this will be a big part of what they do I think rusty stats is is a the biggest part of the tempo piece because he's so good at it 
And as fast as they played at times last year, I think they can be a bit faster because he's kind of, uh, like I said, set this tone there. So you kind of eliminate some of that. And, and you know, then and then you've got quarterbacks in the setting like this that, you know, they may call their own number. They may tuck it and run. Well, they know they're not going to get hit. And so it's just yeah. it's just tricky. There was a, a couple of passes that both quarterbacks, I'm, I know they would love to have back. I mean, I think Barron's in the red zone. Uh, I think Ty Kana picked that off. Uh, I think, uh, you, you know, Shucks, I think across his body, just a weird throw, just kind of throwing it up. It was really windy, but still you, you got to be uh, better than that. And again, I, I mean, I think that everybody will tell you they had looked really good and avoided turnovers for the most part. Both of them have, especially Shuck uh, in the first 14 practices. But when you get cameras on this, <laughs> and we're sitting here talking about it. You know, we weren't talking about any of the other previous Saturday scrimmages and things That's like right, that. Yeah. We're, we're talking about this one. Uh, I, I think it's fair to – but I just know what I saw from Shuck in the last five games – or four, four games, I should say, uh, to, to, to end the season. And, and interceptions or making poor decisions weren't a part of the problem at all. Um, in fact, he, he avoided that and made really good decisions and took care of the ball, which is why you won those games. So – I just don't. I don't concern myself with uh, with any of that. But again, praise the defense, man. Take take three, right? And you got right. it done. <laughs> well, isn't that just about the way it, it has to work, though? Where you're, uh, you're, you're. I mean, there could be a reality out there, some al- alternate universe where Tyler Shuck crushes, Morton looks hobbled, you know, and we're sitting here like, oh man, this is going to be an easy call. This is going to be an easy call for week one, and it still could be to a degree. But like, we just had it set up perfectly where in uh, uh, Red Raider Sports dot com land or Texas Tech Twitter land, uh, that conversation had a little fuel added to its fire well, if it was burning for you to begin with. I, I mean, and again, don't misunderstand what I'm saying or misunderstand what I'm saying, because Baron Morton, I mean, again, all it's all the, like the talent is there. I mean, and, and he he shows you what he's capable of. I mean, you know, just boom, boom. And then it's like deep pass to, to Loic. And it's like, he, he's a stud, man. I mean, so yeah. it's just, but, but you're going to have to pick one, you know? And I, I, I will say, I will say this. And you, you talk about you know, like week one and, and all those things. I think, I think that in, in some ways, I think that Joey and his staff, felt like in some ways they hurt the team by not getting out in front of a decision much earlier than they did uh, really? last year because just just having having the team know who the guy's going to be having that guy helping him be able to lead and again if you if you don't know then you you can't just go yeah well he's our right. guy if you don't really know but if you if you have any inkling this is for sure who, who the starting quarterback is going to be. I'm just not going to be surprised at all if you if you hear something along those lines, whether it be, you know, in the next week, uh, you know, early June. I don't know uh, because I think that – I think they would like to, in some ways, take somebody to Big 12 Media Days and, like, rep the, rep the team at, from that position and, and, and things sure. like that. I think there's some thought that that, that helps you. And, and and all that, and everybody knows who to look to. So we'll see what we get. But I, I'm like you. I, I think Baron he, again. He just he just shows you all the tools. Now again, he had to, he had a mistake or two too as as well. But yeah, um, it'll it'll have come down to consistency. It'll have come down to all the things that we've talked about. And I'll give you I'll give you two stats, uh, one on each guy that I think kind of sums them up this spring. We talked about this on the on the broadcast on Saturday. Tyler Shuck is, I think, um, his completion percentage in team period settings is, I think, 13 to 16 percent higher this spring than it was last. And he was really good last year, okay, in spring football. But I think he's in the 73 percent range completion percentage in team settings this entire spring, okay? I think that with Barron, his deal is is that what he had like something like 80 negative plays okay last spring overall in team settings like you take a sack you you get you you get uh 
you know, you try to hand it off, it gets blown up, you, you know, just, uh, you know, whatever it may be, 80, 80 ish negative plays. This spring, only 15 to 20. So he's really cleaned that up. And, and I think, you know, Tyler has really gotten better with accuracy and just improved. It just shows you that he's just not missing a whole lot. But Barron's kind of cleaned up some of the, you know, the mistakes that he had and just avoiding those negative plays and getting behind the chains. So mm-hmm. both guys have really, I think, improved in, in different ways with things that they maybe needed to improve on. Well, and <clears throat> you know the old saying, iron sharpens iron, and we want to yeah, be absolutely. iron. So be iron, boys. Let's be iron. You've got to have the right uh, approach intangibly, however, to be iron. All right, I'm swerving before we leave this topic and get to some things on the hardwood for Grant McCaslin and the Red Raiders, Daniel Boncho as well. Chris, I'm, I'm swerving hard left into another football neighborhood just because I wanted to touch on this for a moment so it would give me the chance uh, to go burl lives on the NCAA and tell them, go teach your grandmother to suck X. Because Friday... Uh, after we had our conversation for Friday's episode, we finally got some clarity on our boy Kosai Eldridge. And a an appeal was denied. Juco issues of whatever kind. You're going for a waiver to be a Red Raider for one more time around. It does not happen. Kosai made clear, of course, he's not transferring. He's out, out of eligibility. Uh, He wanted to be here again. Joey McGuire obviously wanted him to be here again. We all wanted him to be here again. I don't remember the last NCAA process I wasn't frustrated with, other than maybe the NCAA men's basketball tournament. They seem to do that one all right, I guess. Uh, They didn't let us in last year, though. Big screw up. Um, Anyway, I I was perturbed by this, Chris. If not the eventual decision, the lingering nature of this entire thing when you've got pro days and you've got spring camps and you've got so many things to consider for an individual, I just feel like this timeline uh, is an embarrassment once again. And maybe I am a little bit biased because I didn't get the result I wanted, but it's mostly the process that I just have extreme issue with. Yeah. Very, very frustrating. Uh, I, yeah. And I, and I think it just took too long. Um I, I wish they would have let, you know, because really it, it, it sucks for him that it took so long and then this was the result. It wouldn't have mattered necessarily if you'd have waited this long and he would have been granted this extra year. But right. now he's in a bind where he didn't wasn't able to really train for pro day and and, and go through the, the draft process. And he's kind of just been in, in no man's land, if you will, for, for a while, just kind of in limbo. And, and I just, yeah, I just hate it for him. He is a phenomenal dude, man. And he's going to be a really good coach. Uh, so it's not going to surprise me if we see him come back through here. It's, it, you know, years later uh, as a as a graduate assistant or or whatever, kind of like Deshaun Johnson is doing now. But because yeah. I think Kosai is a brilliant cat, uh, wants to get into coaching. This is what he wants to do when his playing career is over. But – you know, the, the plate has been widened for somebody like Kosai Eldridge in that there's a lot more opportunities to to extend your playing career with the USFL, the XFL now at play. Those seasons are going on right now. So if he doesn't get his name called this week with the NFL draft uh, coming up Thursday, you know, I, I do think there's some opportunities for him to play professionally. So we'll, we'll just kind of see. But it you know, and, and I, I will say this before we leave this topic. I, because you get that news, I think you're, you're kind of – that is a position of semi-concern for you. Yeah. You don't feel like you have a lot of answers there yet. You you think you may know. Jacob Rodriguez, Josiah Pierre, Tyreek Matthew, uh, you know, s- s- some guys right there, Ben Roberts, Kana, guys like that. But th- these are mostly unproven guys at this position. And I just don't think we – have praised Kosai and Krishan Merriweather enough for last year because they were there steady uh, and productive all throughout. And that just can't be overlooked. So I, I say all that to say, if you do add somebody in the portal, like late, okay, I think it's going to be on defense one and two. It could be an interior linebacker just yeah. to kind of protect yourself a little bit. So we'll see. Yeah, I just hate it so much for Eldridge as a football yes. player too because, man, he was trending upward. That That is one dude who last season I thought was was only getting into his best football as a Red Raider. 
uh, as the season was concluding. He had just been on like a stair step, it seemed like, throughout the season, uh, playing better and better and better and would have loved to, to see him given an opportunity to continue here, that Texas, here at Texas Tech. But nonetheless, that's the way the dust settles. So wishing him luck in his next endeavor. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, wait with bated breath for our next opportunity to cuss the NCAA. Should be about, I don't know, five, ten minutes or so, maybe before the episode uh, is done. We're getting to hoops coming up next to wrap it up. Daniel Bacho's not going to be a Red Raider. Whoa, no Bacho? Why no Bacho? We'll get to it next on Locked on Texas Tech. Make sure to make it nice a part of your day on Locked On Texas Tech on the Locked On Podcast Network. He's Chris Level. I'm Casey Cowan. Always appreciate being your first listen. Hope for your second listen, you're going to check out Locked On's NFL Mock Draft Special. It's here bigger than ever, and you can follow along with all 32 teams' first pick in a six-episode ultimate mock draft experience. Only Locked On can deliver. All episodes available right now on the Locked On NFL Draft on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Chris, before we get out of here today, some news that I did not want as a Texas Tech fan. This is on a basketball front. Daniel Bacho is headed to Ruston, Louisiana to be a Louisiana Tech Bulldog. He was on my short list of guys that I really wanted to be back uh, in a Red Raider uniform next year. And uh, wondering how we got here, how full-throated the pursuit was by Texas Tech, how close or far they might have been. Uh, because if I was in those shoes, this is this is definitely a guy I'd be putting the full court press on. Uh, but I wonder from your vantage, uh, what's your feel for how this turned out? Yeah, I, I do think uh, this was a weird one. Okay, I know I know conversations had been ongoing uh, most of last week and, and really the weeks prior. I think uh, Bacho entered the portal. Um, he's a different he's a different guy, right? And I think he's. Um. I think last year, I don't think, I don't think he and uh, I'm trying to think of a way to phrase this. Uh, I don't know if he necessarily and the he and the head coach got along very well, um, and so I think he was kind of looking at a fresh start here. And um, I do think that they they did want to keep him. I do think there was conversations with with Bacho and and Grant McCaslin last uh, week. Uh, and, and other folks in Lubbock uh, about, you know, just kind of his support circle and things like that, but about staying. And then I guess Friday communication was cut off and then uh, he, uh, he makes the decision to attend Louisiana tech. And, and here's the Talvin Hester is the, is the head coach at Louisiana tech. And he was at he was at uh, Texas Tech on Mark Adams' staff a year ago uh, when when he went to the Sweet Sixteen and gets the head job at Louisiana Tech. But the connection really is uh, there's there's a guy named Darshawn McClellan I, I think uh, that is uh, was a graduate assistant here at Texas Tech in that one year that Talvin was here and Talvin took him and made him an assistant coach and Darshawn is kind of somebody that worked out with the bigs and all that so there's the relationship there. Uh, I, I will say though I I. I I think that he goes to Louisiana Tech without really any NIL influence at all. Uh, that's not how La Tech is rolling. And so that part, uh, because I, I think he could have gone to a much higher level school, I think a power five uh, school. Um, I, but I think in his mind or th- he was sold that he he would potentially be a better pro prospect at Louisiana Tech than he would have been at Texas Tech, and he'd be showcased more. I don't know mm. kind of the thought process there. I'm with you, though. I'll miss him. I think he would have fit great here. I think that that's a hard, hard piece to replace. Uh, I think he offered rim protection and rebounding and playing hard. Again, when he was right, uh, I think when he got hurt and sick and, and Fardos came back last year, I think it was a weird scenario that he really never recovered from, but he could have been your starting center here for the next two to three years, and I think you would have been really pleased with that. But uh, you know, it's not what it doesn't look like that's what you're going to get. Yeah, I would add youth to the list of things that he could have brought as well. Just as far as 
unrealized potential that's still out there yeah. for him. He he was always kind of in the baby giraffe category for me. Absolutely. But uh, I wanted to see the giraffe grow up and start getting into those whip and neck fights. You ever seen <laughs> one of those? I mean, those things are amazing. You think a baby giraffe is something to just be cute and cuddly. No, nah, wait till it turns its uh, neck into like a, a ball and chain. Uh, so we won't see that. And yeah, you're right, dude. It was a cat owner with mutton chops. You think that's not a unique dude? So you better be able to tailor your approach to a personality <laughs> like that <laughs> if he doesn't pan out as a basketball player maybe he'll be the next uh big man in uh, a princess bride sequel or something like that but uh enjoy yeah you i like it you, you're doing the andre the giant yeah, I mean, like, it's uh, not far yes, off, right that's right that's they, they right they both speak french i think i don't yeah. remember andre's from belgium or something or... i bet i bet bacho can't drink wine like uh, andre the giant used to could <laughs> yet again unrealized potential <laughs> so we don't know we don't know what the future holds but I uh, hate to see you miss out on that one, and we'll have some more coming up later this week on Texas Tech's continued pursuit of size, which was going to be going on with or without Bacho. But, man, uh, your front court becomes uh, quite the pressing issue as you're trying to reassemble a roster. And I don't even really mean pressing like it's got to happen tomorrow or within whatever, but it's clearly a priority as you're getting ready for uh, Grant McCaslin's first season in West Texas and maybe even more so now. So, Missing out on that. Hate to see it, but uh, you'll move on, and we'll see who's going to be man in the paint uh, in year one under Coach McCaslin. It will not be Bacho. It will not be Fardaz Amak, who uh, is in Berkeley now. Best of luck with that. Chris, uh, appreciate all the insights, man. Football, basketball, you're chopping it up. You were looking slick on ESPN Plus on Saturday. Great job on the television broadcast. I do have a little envy uh, allowing you to share a microphone with anyone else, but I know you are a wanted man all around town in many circles. So that's just what comes with dancing with Big Handsome. I get it. And uh, you did a great job, man. Thanks for coming out today. You're nice to say that. Hey, man, and there's, there's, uh, you're, you're a wanted man as well for different reasons. But, hey, we, exactly. won't, we, won't, we, won't, we, won't, we won't get into that, though. This is, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll keep that just to ourselves here. <laughs> Appreciate you guys for hanging with us once again on Locked on Texas Tech. Subscribe on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts so you never miss an episode. We'll see you for the next time around. For Chris, I'm Casey right back here on Locked on Texas Tech.